Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you to everyone who is joining us for this webinar on oral health and comprehensive cleft care. I am Susanna Schaefer, President and CEO of Smile Train, the world's largest cleft lip and palate organization. Today, you'll be hearing from me, cleft and oral health experts from around the world, and colleagues at FDI and GSK as we present new guidelines that integrate oral health and dental care into the cleft care continuum. I'll begin by giving a little bit of background around SmileTrain's work to explain why this partnership between SmileTrain and FDI and the support of GSK is so very important to us. As you know, cleft lip and or palate is the most common birth difference of the face and mouth. Children with clefts can have difficulty eating, breathing, hearing, speaking, and ultimately thriving. Since 1999, Smile Train has partnered directly with local hospitals in more than 90 countries, empowering local medical professionals with funding, resources, and the training necessary to provide cleft surgery and ongoing cleft care to patients in their own communities. We're not a mission-based organization. We believe that increasing healthcare capacity through local partnerships is the most sustainable way to support medical professionals and patients, both now and in the future. After more than two decades of working with our partners, after supporting more than 1.5 million surgical treatments and thousands of cleft care treatments, we have gained a great deal of experience and expertise in what it takes to provide the best outcome for patients with clefts. There is an urgent need for not only trained and equipped surgeons and anesthetists, but for integrated cleft teams that can provide the necessary range of care throughout a child's life. Oral health professionals are a critical part of this team. Children with clefts are at an increased risk for poor oral health. My colleague, Dr. Peter Mossy, will go into more detail on the medical impact of cleft. But the reality is that without dedicated oral health care, the outcome of a patient's cleft surgery and their ability to eat, speak, and live without pain or discomfort is compromised. It is critical that all individuals with clefts have access to oral health professionals who are aware of their needs and that every member of the cleft care team knows when to refer a patient back to their oral health provider. It is critical that every family understands their role in supporting their child's oral health and that every child understands how to take responsibility for their own health as they grow and mature. The availability, quality, and consistency of this care will impact their health and the trajectory of their entire life. This is why Smile Train and FDI, with the support from GSK, have come together to develop educational resources for professionals and non-professionals alike. Over the next two years, we will continue to work with our expert team to develop materials that teach patients and families about the importance of oral health, explain the challenges of oral health care beyond cleft surgery, and provide vital guidance and support to patients. The guidelines we are presenting today are built around the idea that all clinicians involved in the care of those affected by clefts have a role to play in maintaining a healthy smile. Of course, like any guidelines, these will only have value when they are paired with the dedication, experience, and expertise of medical professionals and can help patients live a happier, healthier life. Today, we are grateful to all health professionals who change the lives of their patients, including patients with clefts, every day. FDI, Smile Train, and GSK are proud to support you as key members of the global cleft community, and we thank you for your work. We invite you to visit the new Smile Train webpage for oral health resources at smiletrain.org slash oral health, which hosts the guidelines and will be updated with the educational resources that will continue to come out of this historic partnership. 
Thank you all, and we look forward to working with the oral health community to ensure that every child with a cleft has the future that they deserve. I now would like to invite Dr. Peter Mossy to join us and present on why, in particular, oral health and dental care is so particularly important for people with clefts. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, my name is Peter Mossy. Um, I am honored and privileged to be asked to present uh, on behalf of the expert team uh, appointed by FDI and Smile Train to develop uh, these much needed guidelines. All children everywhere should have access to oral health and dental care for their health and well being. Um, it is a basic human right. This means having healthy dietary advice, good oral hygiene, and uh, brushing fluoride advice and also regular access to dental care. So today we are addressing a problem that afflicts a very special uh, but very vulnerable population, those who are born with cleft of the lip or palate. For some reason, uh, these children are more susceptible to early childhood uh, caries and we need to understand the reasons why. Here is what we know about uh, susceptibility to poor oral health among uh, children with clefts. They're more likely to have uh, dental anomalies such as extra teeth, uh, missing teeth and malformed teeth. Also the quality of bone supporting the teeth can be thinner and obviously in unilateral and bilateral clefts, there are bony defects uh, around the cleft site. And enamel defects are also more prevalent in this group. Secondly, infants with clefts of the lip or palate are likely to have uh, difficulties with feeding. Firstly, unable to, they are unable to create complete closure over the nipple for suckling and without proper feeding counselling uh, they tend to have um, more sugary supplements um, in their liquid feed. Also plates may be used to facilitate feeding and these gather food and uh, accumulation of plaque deposits and of, uh, there is also a longer clearance time for food from the mouth, uh, which tends to generate fermentable sugars from uh, starches, which feed the plaque bacteria. Thirdly, there are a range of other factors that may apply in individual cases. These children are less likely to access care uh, due to problems with deprivation, marginalization, uh, the stigma of the cleft and geographic barriers to treatment. There's also increased anxiety surrounding their mouths because of the cleft and they report lower oral health uh, related quality of life. And finally, they're more likely to have prolonged uh, orthodontic treatment. So, what is our response to this problem? Well, those from FDI, Smile Train, and GSK have teamed up in this very impressive response. And that is to produce a set of guidelines for providers and health givers. Uh, in a following presentation, uh, Dr. Lola Orinuga uh, will present the essence of these and the guidelines will ensure that we can mitigate the adverse effects of the surgery, the poor diet, uh, pain and problems with speech and uh, psycho psychology or quality of life. So in conclusion, the whole idea behind uh, this project is 
to support the various members of the multidisciplinary team to ensure that those born with clefts uh, feel supported, feel cared for and loved, and can achieve the best possible outcomes, which includes a healthy smile, and that they are therefore capable of achieving their full potential in life. And as I hand over uh, to Dr. Lola Orinuga, I thank you sincerely uh, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mossi. It's a honor to be here today as a part of the expert panel appointed by FDI World Dental Federation and Smile Train to prepare the guidelines for oral health in comprehensive cleft care for oral health professionals and the wider cleft team. From February to July 2020, Professor Muthu Murugan at Sri Ramachandra Institute, in collaboration with the expert panel of the oral health in comprehensive cleft care, expert team, carried out a systematic review of the existing literature and published guidelines for the oral health care of people born with cleft. Using the agreed to tool, appraisal of guidelines, research and evaluation, to assess the quality of the seven identified guidelines, the researchers concluded that the existing guidelines were of low to moderate quality and did not provide comprehensive guidance for the multidisciplinary team involved in the care of patients with cleft. This paper will be published later in 2020. FDI World Dental Federation and Smile Train recognized that everyone involved in providing care for patients with cleft has a responsibility to ensure the patient has and can maintain good oral health. Parents or guardians may need extra support and encouragement to learn how to clean around the cleft area and understand how to prevent oral disease. The patient should be empowered to maintain their own oral health and have support with their oral hygiene routine until around the age of eight years. Several classification modalities exist for assessing the severity of cleft. The FDI Smile Train team advocates for the adoption of the LaSalle system. An anatomical based classification known as LaSalle uses the lip L, alveolus A, hard H, and soft S palate to describe the characteristics of the cleft. The first character is for the patient's right lip and the last character for the patient's left lip. LaSalle code indicates a complete cleft with a capital letter and an incomplete cleft with a small letter. No cleft is represented with a dash. The LaSalle is adopted because it is simple to understand by both oral and not oral health professionals. The key messages in the guideline. All providers involved in the care of cleft patients have a role in maintaining the patient's oral health and well-being. It is important that agreed protocols are developed and adopted for providers to ensure good interdisciplinary communication. The objectives of interdisciplinary communication are to optimize patients' oral health and well-being, including the ability to eat, speak, breathe, and swallow. Providers should shop support caregivers as they more worry about how their children's teeth reappear when they erupt, and also about their children's oral health. Caregivers and guardians should be encouraged to learn how to clean the cleft area and the mouth. It is also important that they understand what causes oral diseases and how to prevent them. During the life course of our patients, they will also be undergoing treatment with many other specialties. Genetic testing, speech and language therapy, hearing tests, surgery and surgical revision. The whole team should communicate regularly 
to ensure the patient is receiving the right care at the right time and quickly refer to each other should they have any concerns about the oral health and or development of the patient. The guidelines for oral health and non-oral health professionals are arranged per age group, zero to two years, two to six years, six to 12 years, 12 to 18 years and above 18 years. And they provide guidance for the oral health and non-oral health team throughout the patient's lifetime. The key messages for oral health professionals in the guideline is the practice of minimally invasive dentistry to allow for retention of the primary dentition and preservation of the natural tooth substance. If available, silver diamine fluoride may be used and frequent topical fluoride application encouraged. It is important that monitoring and assessment of early childhood caries is carried out on these children as early childhood caries is a higher burden in children with cleft. At each patient contact, intensive oral hygiene instructions and behavior modification should be given. As the patient grows and, its need, and the need changes from obturator to removable appliance to orthodontic appliance, the counseling and instructions will also change as appropriate. Patients with cleft often suffer long-term psychological effects, and it is necessary that they're given the appropriate counseling and support as necessary. It is also the role of us as oral health professionals to provide them with the appropriate dental prosthesis and provide non-invasive cosmetic procedures such as composite restorations. For the non-horror health professionals, they are able to assess for risk of developing oral diseases. The items on the risk assessments include active or previous caries lesions, low socioeconomic status, frequent consumption of dietary sugars, reduced salivary flow or salivary pH, poor oral hygiene, suboptimal fluoride exposure, familiar risk factors such as educational level of parents and siblings oral health. We should note that each item on the risk assessment increases the risk of the patient having oral diseases and a combination of the items increases the risk significantly for dental decay or periodontal disease. The key messages for non-oral health professionals are to assess for the risk of developing oral diseases, ensure that prescribed medicines are sugar-free. They can also carry out what we refer to as lift the lip. They can provide a brief oral health intervention at each patient's visit and coordinate with the dental team. Our oral health non-oral health colleague can assess the teeth for the following. White spots, brown spots, red bleeding gums, tooth decay, and dental plaque buildup. We call this lift the leap. They can also use the, this opportunity to advise the patients on toothbrushing twice daily, not to rinse out but spit. Avoid snacking between meals and recommend consumption of Things like yogurt, cheese, or old foods, which should do not encourage decay. So or drink only water or milk between meals and visit the dentist at every appointment. Throughout the patient's life, age-appropriate oral hygiene should be taught. 
from birth, gone wiping around the, the around the cliff after every feed and morning and night. As the first teeth erupt, assisted tooth brushing, and as the patient grows, children should be assisted and supervised with a tooth brushing and oral hygiene until the age of eight years. During adolescence, where they will be undergoing orthodontic treatment and they have braces, tailored brushing techniques should be taught to keep the braces clean. And at adulthood, they may have undergone advanced restorative procedures, such as bridge work, implants. This required specialized home care for the maintenance and prevention of severe issues later. As oral health professionals, we have a duty in maintaining our patients' oral health and well-being. FDI Smile Train, with the support of GSK, is delighted to release these guidelines today to improve the oral health of children born with cleft. I will now hand over to Dr. Gerhard Seeberger, the President, FDI World Dental Federation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renoga. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted that all of you could join us for this webinar today. I would like to start by giving you a brief background of our work to support the oral health and dental care for children born with cleft. In 2019, FDI World Dental Federation was delighted to partner with the oral health nonprofit Smile Train to improve oral care for patients with cleft. With the support of GlaxoSmithKline, we've been able to launch the project Oral Health in Comprehensive Cleft Care, which integrates oral health professionals into the cleft care continuum. The project also provides educational resources for oral health professionals, for the wider cleft care team, for parents and for caregivers. Today, we're excited to present the work of our global expert team who have collaborated to produce the oral health and comprehensive cleft care guidelines. These guidelines provide complete guidance on how to prevent oral diseases and maintain a functional, a natural, and a healthy dentition for people born with clefts. Children born with clefts are at a significantly higher risk of suffering from dental caries and periodontal disease. Often, even when they do receive essential surgery, they still have missing teeth or tooth malformations. As oral health professionals, we are aware of the long-term impact oral diseases have on the overall health, on the development and well-being of children and adults. We understand the need for comprehensive, multidisciplinary healthcare, and to support this integration, oral health professionals must receive accurate quality guidance and education in caring for people with clefts. FDI World Dental Federation as the representative for over 1 million dentists worldwide alongside SmileTrain and with the support of GSK extends their sincere gratitude to the whole oral health care community for their continued dedication to address the global oral disease burden and improve oral health. Thank you for joining us. Every year, more than 200,000 babies are born with cleft lip and or palate. Children with clefts have an increased risk of cavities, periodontal disease, and other oral health challenges as they grow and develop. But in low- and middle-income countries, many of these children do not have access to basic oral health care. Without ongoing dental care from providers familiar with their unique needs, children with clefts can have difficulty speaking and eating, and lack of adequate care can even threaten the success of future cleft surgery. From the first preventative care appointments to orthodontic and prosthodontic care, high-quality dental care is a building block of a happy and healthy future for children with clefts. Dentists are essential members of their care team. That is why SmileTrain and FDI and the World Dental Federation 
with support from GSK Consumer Healthcare, have joined forces to launch the Oral Health and Cleft Patients Project. Together, we will provide guidelines and educational resources for oral health and non-oral health professionals that address the oral health needs of patients with clefts. Alongside the oral health community, we will work to increase access to essential care and ensure that no child is left behind. Smile Train, FDI, and GSK are proud to acknowledge and support oral health professionals as key members of the global cleft community. And to the countless dental professionals who are changing the lives of children with clefts each and every day, thank you. Thank you, Jehard, and good afternoon, everyone. This video really demonstrates the vital role that dental professionals play in improving the care for nearly 200,000 babies born every year with cleft lip or palate, a role that we at GSK Consumer Healthcare are truly honored to support. At GSK, our team is committed to fighting preventable oral health problems with science-based products and services. We truly believe that our mouths should be a source of joy and not pain. Therefore, we share a common purpose with Smile Train. And that's why about two and a half years ago, we formed a partnership to help improve care for the people suffering with cleft lips or palate in order to enable them to lead fuller and healthier lives. For us, this is about doing well by doing good. Over the last two and a half years, we are proud to have enabled about 8,000 life-transforming surgeries. We've also sponsored the comprehensive cleft care program aimed at providing holistic and ongoing care to these people. And we believe in Smile Train's sustainable model and therefore have invested in their efforts to educate and empower nearly 2,000 dentists, surgeons, nurses, anesthesiologists, speech therapists, and nutritionists around 52 countries in the world. At GSK, we are proud of our association with FDI. Over the last 10 years, we've together delivered science-driven initiatives like the Global Periodontal Health Project and the Oral Health Observatory. So together, over the last, over this project of um, enabling better cleft care, we are truly proud to have partnered with both FDI and Smile Train in the development of oral health in comprehensive cleft care guidelines being released today. We know that people with cleft lip or palate have a significantly higher risk of suffering from dental caries or periodontal diseases, but that doesn't have to be the case. By providing dental professionals like yourselves evidence-based resources, we can provide, we can together provide better care to people with cleft lips or palate and help improve their lives and their families' lives. These guidelines on preventing oral care diseases in people with cleft care or palate, or cleft lips or palate is another great step in our joint journey together to connect dental professionals with people suffering from cleft lip or palate. We are starting a pilot in India, which will be very soon followed up with further pilots in Mexico and in Nigeria. There is still so much to do. And by working collaboratively with dental professionals like yourselves, we truly believe that we can make a significant positive difference. 
I would now like to pass the webinar over to Dr. Peter Mossy, who will be taking you through the question and answer sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, everyone who has joined uh, today's webinar. And um, you will note that uh, we now are uh, ready to accept uh, questions. We've got uh, myself, Peter Mossy. I've got Dr. Lola Oranuga, Dr. Susanna Schaefer. And I'm going to start off just briefly with Dr. Gerhard Seeberger, who is the president of the International Dental Federation. And I think today you're witnessing a unique collaboration um, between organizations to make this possible. And I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Seeberger just to um, just explain how this came about, this unique collaboration. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for introducing me so nicely. And thank you for, to Lola and to Susanna for being with me. And why is it that we are sitting together? So let me tell you a little story. Since 2018, GSK Healthcare is a strategic partner of SmileTrain. And it's not only that they gave financial support to SmileTrain for their global cleft programs in order to bring smiles to so many people around the world, but they also support global awareness building around cleft lip and palate and oral health. And part of SmileTrain's uh, strategic plan is to expand their programs to offer every facet of comprehensive cleft care to every patient in need. And this includes a 360 degrees oral health care. To support this plan, GSK arranged an incredible opportunity introducing SmileTrain to the longstanding partner, the FDI World Dental Federation. And we were very happy, I need to, uh, to tell you that. There's a huge need for high quality comprehensive resources on cleft care and oral health. And as SmileTrain and FDI share their passion for enabling healthy, happy lives through all healthcare, it was almost a must to come together to address this need. With GSK's crucial support, SmileTrain and FDI have joined forces to support people with clefts and medical professionals through this groundbreaking two-year project. So that's all what I can tell you so far, and I give the word back to Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. And we're delighted to see uh, so much contribution through the chat box, and we will now proceed uh, to take your questions. And uh, between this uh, panel, um, we will hopefully be able to elaborate further on these uh, guidelines and other aspects of uh, comprehensive cleft care. Um, the very first question, in fact, is an interesting one, uh, just asking about percentage of babies bor born worldwide with the condition of uh, cleft lip and palate. And of course, the uh, orofacial clefts are a, a broad and a range of different conditions. Um, and totally, uh, when they're taken as a whole, account for one and 700 live births. Uh, that's an aggregate um, uh, statistic across the world. And there is a uh, variation. As one of the other questions asked, uh, is there a, a world map that shows the variation? And indeed there are um, world maps, one of which is on the FDI uh, Vision 2020 uh, website that you can maybe access. But it shows that the highest rates of cleft lip and palate in the world um, tend to be uh, in the eastern uh, areas, Japan, China, uh, parts of India seem to have high prevalence. The lowest rates in the world, interestingly, are in sub-Saharan Africa. And then intermediate rates among the Caucasian populations, Hispanic populations, and therefore there is geographic and ethnic variation. So. Um, uh, I'll take the next uh, question in, in relation to, uh, it's a clinical question about treatment planning, and uh, that will be uh, something of interest, great interest to uh, uh, Lola, and uh, I'll ask her to deal with uh, treatment planning in cleft care uh, in, okay. in health. Well, thank Lola. you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, um, this question has to do with, um, what are the things we should keep in mind while treatment planning? 
You should note that um, as um, oral health professionals, the role of the dentist is very essential, especially where preventive care is concerned, prevention of oral health diseases, in particular dental caries, which is of a greater higher burden in these children. And then more importantly as well, they have a lot of other problems that come into play there. The speech, psychosocial, and um, a lot of concerns about eruption of teeth. A number of these items are, are dealt with in the guidelines and um, are available online at the Smile Train website as well as the um, FDI website in English. So, and most importantly, well, as um, oral health professionals, we should collaborate effectively with the other care providers in making sure that these children get the best at the right time. I hope that yeah. answers that question. That's that's very good uh, signposting to the the guidelines, and um, mm -hmm. and I'll just move on to the very interesting question that relates to uh, the high incidence and the access problems in places uh, where they are low to middle income countries such as India and in fact a similar question arose in the context uh, of uh, sub-Saharan Africa or Nigeria so mm -hmm. I will um, I know that uh, uh, Susanna is very interested in this mm -hmm. particular aspect and uh, if I can ask Susanna to respond sure thank you Peter um, so if you know, um, there's more need uh, to understand more. You can always visit Smile Train uh, India or Smile Train Africa's uh, program websites. Um, it would either be smiletrainindia.org or smiletrainafrica.org. And there you can find uh, information about hospitals that partner with Smile Train. Um, at some hospitals, Smile Train offers grants to cover patient transport to and from uh, treatment including surgery, speech therapy, and orthodontics. Um, dental care grants are not yet available. However, the goal of the new oral health and comprehensive cleft care guidelines and the upcoming education resources from FDI, GSK, and Smile Train is to set the foundation for this grant program in the near future. Um, so please stay in touch uh, with Smile Train uh, to learn more uh, as these become available. And again, you can visit uh, either websites, smiletrainindia.org or smiletrainafrica.org. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Susanna. And sure. let, let me take uh, the next question myself. It's related to the diagnosis uh, before a child is born. And um, we refer to that as, as prenatal diagnosis. And indeed, it is uh, possible through ultrasound to identify um, a cleft as early as 12 to 15 weeks. Um, the difference, uh, however, is that while a cleft lip uh, is easily diagnosed by, uh, well, by skilled ultrasonographers, um, cleft palate is not so visible. Um, and indeed, uh, the cleft palate cannot uh, so uh, may not be diagnosed until birth or even after birth um, but also a range of uh, syndromes and craniofacial abnormalities as well as clefts can be diagnosed uh, in advance the value of this is the psychological preparation um, of the family and they can be prepared for the birth of a child that has this uh, repairable birth defect and that's extremely important um, in uh, the comprehensive cleft care to be prepared uh, for that and to ensure that the family are uh, psychologically prepared, but also have a program of care available. So I'll move from that to uh, another question, which I think is um, extremely important. It asks about after surgical treatment, what's the value of comprehensive care and good oral health care? And again, Lola may want to contribute to that answer, and I can also add, but Lola, um, post-surgical mm -hmm. care. Oh, for post-surgical care, 
Um, there are quite a number of problems, um, apart from the orthodontic aspect, the dental anomalies, the speech, the psychosocial. You know, so it, um, the important thing here is um, we should have um, a great protocols in the facilities, and at the same time, effective interdisciplinary collaboration between the experts, and most importantly, what are, um, the question says why they have to take more concern about it because, hmm, well, um, because the speech problems and the psychosocial problems that these patients have, so it's very important that they address early, and in particular, for the oral health aspect, the emphasis is on prevention because we don't want to have them um, developing um, concerns for need for extractions that we will around them to have um, um, prosthesis that are very difficult to manage. So as much as possible, it's better to have uh, prevention is very key. And then the orthodontic aspect too, malocclusion is very important. And all this uh, as well uh, on the guidelines, uh, stated on the guidelines as well. So, yeah. yeah, and just and adding as an orthodontist, yeah. yeah, as as an orthodontist, I know that um, one of the key words we always say is that uh, the bone is gold and the teeth are even more important than that. So it's very very important that we have excellent dental care and good quality of teeth and bone, um, so as to have the optimum outcome so the prevention aspects that we deal with uh, even prior to having orthodontic treatment carried out and braces fitted uh, we ensure uh, good oral hygiene through toothbrushing uh, regular fluoride applications and good dietary advice avoiding sugars yes. and fine carbohydrates yeah and as as lola has just very nicely said this uh, multidisciplinary communication is so important so that all aspects can be addressed uh, simultaneously for the best possible outcomes so uh we also uh are now having uh, additional uh questions and um there one that I will ask Susanna just to address is how to join Smile Train as a dental professional. Uh, uh, would you be able to address that, Susanna? Sure. Well, our programs are cleft focused, and uh, dental care is obviously uh, being incorporated into our programs. So the best uh, way to stay connected is uh, by by visiting our websites, um, which I had mentioned earlier. So there's smiletrain.org/slash oral health. Um, and then our regional websites I had mentioned before, smiletrainindia.org and smiletrainafrica.org. Um, we also have uh, websites for uh, Asia, uh, or China, excuse me, and uh, the Americas region. Um, but everything connects back to smiletrain.org. But that is where you can find access to the list of our partner hospitals. Um, and be connected to a Smile Train uh, staff representative uh, who is on the ground or, or managing a region of countries um, that can help direct you to our partners. And as we start to uh, bring along our dental programs within our Smile Train Club programs, um, we will be having opportunities to connect uh, with dental care providers. So we're very, very excited uh, for this, and we are so grateful to. FDI and to GSK for this wonderful opportunity. Thanks, Susanna. Uh, and actually, the next question from uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ghani from Pakistan is about the contribution of GSK helping the training of general uh, general dental practitioners. And uh, um, maybe Gerhard, uh, in terms of FDI and uh, GSK the GDP uh, input. Um, I know that's addressed in our guidelines, but uh, you may want to uh, elaborate. 
Yes, um, I mean the domain of the oral health of the general uh, oral health professional or general practitioner is uh, quite clear to everyone. Take care of the heart and soft tissues, of course. Uh, take care of an adequate hygiene, as you already said it before, Peter. Of course, also dietary advices to stay away from refined carbohydrates and uh, added sugar products. And uh, if you go to uh, processed products, you will probably sometimes wonder that you find sugar also in salad added and uh, sugar sweetened beverages. Um, to uh, this, I may add um, the function of the uh, general dental practitioner. He should definitely be the coordinator between the specialists in order to guarantee the best assistance and care for uh, uh, patients uh, with cleft palate. Um, I would also at this point enlarge a little bit the uh, um, not only specialists from the medical profession, but uh, as we look also at the uh, assistance during uh, the growth of this child and of course also uh, through the educational period so maybe also try to get in touch with speech therapists and not um, uh, leave that individual to uh, inequalities during the educational part. Yeah, thank you very much, Gerhard. That's uh, uh, excellent to uh, have that uh, perspective from the general practitioner's uh, viewpoint. Um, just to address maybe fairly quickly the uh, age of treatment for cleft lips and palates and uh, also types of surgical procedures? Those are two very good questions. Um, uh, isolated cleft of the palate uh, is usually uh, treated as early as six months, but as, as late as 12 to 15 months uh, in current practice. And uh, for cleft of the lip, um, the usual protocol is to uh, uh, close the lip as soon as the child is thriving and is fit for surgery. That's usually around three months. So three months for a lip closure and uh, six to 12 months for a palate closure. In terms of the surgical procedures used to get better success rate, that's an interesting question from the research point of view. And of course, one of the uh, things that Smile Train have recently done is they're really concerned that to improve the quality of cleft care and the surgical and non-surgical care, research is extremely important, research and innovation. So there are currently ongoing efforts to look at how successful uh, the treatment is at uh, the different ages and using different procedures. Um, and that research will be ongoing to improve quality of care uh, as we go forward. And um, there's one other question I'm noticing about the, uh, how can we reduce dental caries and periodontal problems in cleft lip and palate patients? And while Lola has actually addressed that earlier in mm -hmm. terms of dental caries, could you also mention the periodontal problems, uh, Lola? Well, the per periodontal problems they have, um, gingivitis, they can have gingivitis, can have, this can, if, it, if care is not taken, can lead to, especially in uh, Africans, um, you can have acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis as well, ANO, that we prefer to ANO. And really, the important thing here is that early prevention, so that you don't have the problem coming up. So we educate them about oral health practices, toothbrushing, cleaning the area, the, um, the cleft area clean after every feed and morning and night. And then as the child erupts the teeth, um, supervised and assisted toothbrushing until the child is of uh, age, age of eight. And after that, uh, adolescent, age appropriate devices to be used to brushing. And then when they go through orthodontic treatment as well, you should realize that they'll be having appliances, removable and fixed appliances. They should be taught how to clean the appliances so that they don't have um, concerns, greater issues later. And then furthermore, 
Um, they may also have implants, things that are more elaborate. I mean, this, and these ones actually require special home care as well. So they should be taught how to take, um, there should be a protocol on handling these devices, appliances, when they do come. So the, the emphasis is on prevention, you know, so yeah, and being educated on the dietary advice, also dietary counseling, the tooth friendly foods that are advisable, like fruits, yogurt, and avoiding sugary foods. And then for medications, because a lot of these children uh, are prescribed medications, mm -hmm. emphasis for the um, our medical colleagues to prescribe medications that are sugar free. Yeah. And that and helps the importance also. of fluoride as well. The importance yeah, of fluoride. Exactly. And if available, silver, use of silver diamine fluoride, especially in the primary dentition. And that also helps address the question I see that uh, what is the role of the dental hygienist? The dental hygienist, of course, can mm -hmm. assist with those uh, yeah. aspects that Lola has just outlined. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a very special role uh, for the dental hygienist in those. And there are some other aspects that uh, Lola has just addressed, like the one relating to pediatric dentistry input um, and it's nice to see that there's such enthusiastic interest to help. You know, those from Nigeria and India are offering, you know, their their services and helping with cleft lip and palate uh, prevention and and care. Um, the predisposing factors that lead to cleft lip and palate. Uh, again, a very interesting question, and of course one that's subjected to comprehensive and global research. Uh, over the last few decades and we are learning more and more about both genetic and environmental factors that contribute. So uh, cleft open palate um, is a polygenic multifactorial disorder so there are contributions from uh, the genes, uh, so genetic influence and also from these environmental uh, factors such as uh, diet. Um, people often hear about the role of uh, folic acid. This goes beyond folic acid. There are a whole range of other factors in the diet that may be important. Uh, multivitamin supplements. Um, there's also the avoidance of smoking in particular and contaminated environments. It may not just be active maternal smoking, it's the exposure to passive smoke or the exposure to contaminated environments. And other uh, predisposing factors that we know about are certain drugs and medications. And uh, these should be part of the uh, prenatal preparation uh, for pregnancy. But in the whole, these genetic and environmental factors can be handled um, by improving our knowledge, improving our research, identifying the predisposing genes, which we're doing uh, through global research and then tailoring the environmental factor uh, to minimize the risk. And uh, that's uh, something which I am very interested in and I'm working with colleagues uh, to address. The um, next few questions relate to uh, cleaning and oral hygiene, which uh, I think we've dealt with. Um, yeah. And then, uh, the, there's an interesting question that asks about our system for classification, the, the LASAL. <laughs> and I think both, both myself and Lola are very familiar with this. Lola, yeah. do you want to explain it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, the yeah. LASAL is an anatomical based system. And um, I think um, FDI, GSA, uh, SpyTrain adopted it because it's easy to understand by both oral health and non oral health professionals. In, uh, the L stands for the lip, the A for the alveolus, the S for the soft palate, H for the hard palate, A for the... So looking from, from the, the first L, that's when you're facing the patient, the first L, that's the patient's right, that's the left lip, the right lip, sorry. And then the last L on the other side is the patient's left, okay. now. When they 
you have it in capital letters, L, it means that you have a complete cleft of that L. So if it's on the patient's right, that's complete, and it's in capital L, it means that it has a complete right cleft lip. Okay? So, and um, but if it's in a small letter, it means that it's incomplete. So when you see capitals, it's complete cleft. If it's lowercase, it's incomplete. But when there is no cleft at all, you have a dash. I think that's it. That's a very I want to add, <laughs> I want to add, I'm trying to make it as simple because I don't that's that's tremendous and and the way you've explained it it shows how logical it is it's really easy for anyone when they see a picture to be able mm -hmm. to apply the last hal score and i think that's the beauty of it and yeah. uh, we're certainly happy to promote that uh, through through uh, smile train fdi and uh, these gsk uh, guidelines in addition, um, um, the last hal tool is very good for research because it allows for coding on the computer I read that yes. yeah. And and what I describe as sub phenotyping, so that we have separate types of clefts and separate groups. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, uh, and I think that's going to be extremely important when we're looking for genetic predisposition. So it's a, it's an important uh, classification. Yeah. Um, a simple answer to the gender predilection. Uh, Again, a very interesting question, but in fact, uh, clefts are characterized by uh, gender biases because isolated cleft palate is more common um, in, uh, in females. So about two thirds of females um, uh, in the isolated cleft palate uh, incidence, whereas cleft lip and palate is more common in, in, in male uh, infants. So there is this gender bias, which we don't really understand. We know it must have a, a genetic origin because it is so consistent across different populations. Um, uh, so, so about 70% of cleft lip, uh, either isolated cleft lip or cleft unilateral cleft of the lip and palate are on the, um, also on the left side. So there's the male uh, predilection and also this uh, the left-sided uh, predilection. Um, there is uh, another uh, question about uh, the aids given to patients uh, of cleft lip and palate by the dental professionals. And again, I'm sure uh, Lola and Susanna and Gerhard would say, if you look at those guidelines, uh, mm -hmm. you'll see a comprehensive reference to uh, the kind of, of aids that we advise and some of them have been mentioned in the uh, webinar and the, also the kinds of treatments uh, the, such as the silver diamine fluoride and um, those are uh, comprehensively covered um, within the guidelines so um, let me just get to the the next couple of questions um, Procedures uh, to know about cleft lip or oh, palate yes. intrauterine life. Um, uh, I, I'm assuming that may be referring to the possibility of intrauterine surgery. Is that what you read from that? Which question um, is that? Procedure. There's a one about procedures known for cleft lip and palate and intrauterine life. Well, I do know that mm -hmm. this has been uh, speculated as. Um, because of scar-free wound healing as a possible method uh, for treatment of clefts. But um, the big risk and danger is spontaneous abortion after a surgical intervention, and therefore it's not recommended. So we wait until the child is born and carry out the cleft repairs then. And then risk factors that cause morbidity after operation or procedure or surgery. Um, uh, of course, there are uh, problems uh, ongoing after the surgical repair, and um, maybe one of the ones that's being referred to there are things like hearing problems, speech problems, uh, the uh, cleft, the alveolar cleft, which is a deficiency of bone, uh, which causes a problem, and then there's the psychological and psychosocial problems. So there are 
ongoing problems um, even after the cleft repair. But those by comprehensive multidisciplinary treatment can be very effectively managed. So those risk factors or those causes of post-operative uh, problems can be managed. And uh, that's uh, the, uh, also the growth of the face can be re reduced because there's scar tissue in the lip and there's scar tissue in the palate. So again, those growth problems can be addressed using orthodontics, um, uh, orthopedic procedures, and surgical procedures. Um, so again, uh, we know that we're getting better and better at uh, improving the um, post-surgical treatments and management. Um, now, there's, does anybody else want to comment on that before I move to the, there's a, a consanguinity question that um, I would also be happy to comment on. Uh, is it? I, I, Peter, I would just add on that. Um, is Smile Train's model of sustainability and building capacity in countries immediately addresses what you had just brought up there in that, you know, our goal and, and adding in this component now for dental care um, with the FDI and GSK partnership um, is just going to help us in the breadth of our programs and what we can uh, support our partners with in low and middle income countries um, to build comprehensive cleft care programs in their own communities uh, to treat cleft children uh, with ongoing care. Um, so it is the Smile Train model of, of empowerment and uh, providing the funding and resources uh, to medical professionals, orthodontists, uh, dental practitioners, um, building that full comprehensive cleft care team, including the surgical components, um, psychosocial, uh, nutritional support. Um, it all comes together in a sustainable model. Um, so we're, we're thrilled for this partnership to now uh, be adding the dental component and are excited, so excited for what's to come in this next year. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. We're all uh, looking forward to, to continuing the partnership and to having Smile Train work with, with FDI as we uh, go forward and with all the um, uh, tremendous uh, uh, support that we've received from people uh, within other uh, um, sponsor, uh, sponsored programs. And GSK are a good example of um, a highly motivated group who have oral health as their uh, major component. So it's a great, a great partnership to build on. Um, there is, is a question. Yeah. They, their their uh, message is doing well by doing good. And this is exactly that. So we're incredibly grateful. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's just one I just may have miss, can, uh or, or um, the question on the high prevalence of clefts in sub-Saharan Africa. I may have made um, a, a mistake or else I'll correct mm -hmm. it now. The prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa is actually low. No. Um, it's the lowest uh, in the world in, in terms of the recorded clefts. We do also recognize that the uh, ascertainment, as we call it, the, the diagnosis of all cases as they are born varies in different parts of the world. So the infrastructure for picking up every cleft that's born uh, varies. So maybe although the recorded prevalence is very low uh, or rather low in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, it could be that we're not picking them all up um, and we want to continue to improve that aspect of our care as well, to make sure that systems um, are in place uh, to um, uh, improve the ascertainment. And the good news on that is that the Sustainable Development Goal Program has, uh, as part of SDG3, uh, um, an, an aspiration to universal health coverage. And that um, means that uh, accessibility, availability and affordability of treatment uh, 
are its primary objective. So the universal health coverage is receiving a lot of high level uh, attention at the moment uh, in not just FDI, but also in WHO and in IADR, the International Association for Dental Research. And they want to come together as a partnership to ensure that the sustainable development goals are delivered by 2030. And that would improve access uh, in the most deprived areas of the world. So um, I think we've uh, another question on the guidelines, which um, uh, it was addressed earlier on, um, that we do have both in the FDI and Smile Train uh, uh, sites, we have reference to those. Um, that's correct. They're, they are translated on the Smile Train website now, and FDI is in English, but translation will be coming. Right. Yeah. Very good. Okay, there's a question for me here. Oh, yes. Yeah, please, Lola. Yes, the one on education. No, no, it says dental home. Oh, yes. Yeah, please. It's like, um, would it also be okay? okay? Yeah, the question about dental home um, actually. For as pediatric dentists, we advocate that as early as possible, the child should let, um, be taken to see the dentist, preferably before the first birthday or as soon as the first two erupts. And um, it's very good that a dental home is established by the time the child is one year old, so as to encourage you know, familiarization with dental practice. It's very important and it's a great long way to support children with cleft. And at the same time, um, the non-oral health professionals can also encourage them to visit the dentist, apart from doing the lift the lip that was mentioned. Indeed, yeah. And uh, actually I see a, a question referring to the reasons for cleft um, children be more likely to have oral health problems, problems. and injuries. Um, do you want to say something about that uh, as well, Lola? Well, because of the anatomy of the cleft, we could have um, good debris around that area or the milk around that area. And if the, the, parent, the caregivers are not cleaning properly, that could um, lead to um, predisposing the child to oral health problems. And then moreover, we talk about um, medications that they're being given regularly, especially if they're sweetened medications, which will also be an avenue. And the fact that the parents are so concerned and overwhelmed, they may not be doing the right thing at the right time, you know, doing the oral hygiene practices, effective oral hygiene practices, taking care, and they're so worried about the oral health problems. They don't know what to do. They don't seek treatment or they're, um, I want to put this nicely now. They refuse to seek care because for, for some countries, especially the um, developing countries, you find out that there's a lot of taboo around this type of things and they may not seek oral health care and the child is more or less abandoned and the oral health suffers. So okay. that could be one of the reasons that they are prone, apart from the other ones I mentioned. Yes, indeed. Yeah, there's the, the stigma and uh, that yeah. has been a problem identified both in India and in, in uh, okay. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Um, there's an interesting question about folic acid therapy oh. and I'll, I'll just try to answer that as well mm -hmm. because uh, it is one of the contentious areas uh, in cleft up and palate. We know that folic acid is extremely important in reproductive health. And um, we know, for example, that for neural tube defects, that 400 micrograms of folic acid uh, per day in the periconceptional period um, will um, reduce the risk of uh, spina bifida and neural tube defects by 70%. So that's a huge effect. 
that led to a lot of research on whether the same might apply to cleft lip and palate. And uh, unfortunately, the results are not as effective for uh, cleft lip and palate in terms of prevention um, uh, compared to neural tube defects. There is a marginal effect, it seems, and there's an even more uh, comprehensive effect when you consider multivitamin supplements. So not just folic acid, but uh, other supplements. But a lot of the studies that have looked at this uh, in different countries uh, have um, uh, come across what's called confounding factors. So the possibility that the folic acid might appear to be working could be due to just a range of other healthy lifestyle uh, choices. Because they're taking folic acid, they may also be highly aware of other risk factors. And uh, they also may have more access and availability uh, and, uh, uh, to these uh, medications and supplements. So it's difficult to say, but in the uh, countries in the world that introduced uh, folic acid fortification, and sub, uh, uh, and uh, as part of dietary um, uh, staple food like flour and uh, like milk, as they did uh, uh, in Ireland and, and like in rice, they do have uh, a slight uh, reduction in the prevalence. So there could be a, a marginal effect for folic acid. But what I'm saying is it's really important to take folic acid for reproductive health in general. Um, but different countries may have other factors, environmental factors that also contribute and even dietary factors. Um, for example, I'm aware in India that uh, polished rice uh, actually removes some of the multivitamin uh, um, benefit um, and uh, rather than eating white rice, uh, mm -hmm. it's probably better to, to be eating uh, the brown yeah. rice. Um, and these are, are uh, subject to uh, ongoing studies um, to look at the role of diet and prevention of oral clefts. So, uh, and then um, prevention practices are mentioned there. Uh, and. Uh, prevention both in the context of preventing the cleft but also in the context of preventing the dental um, mm -hmm. and oral uh, disease. So uh, there's a lovely compliment uh, there to Lola. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the question goes to you. I'm particularly about, appreciative. So, snacking in between meals? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've you've actually mentioned that one earlier. Yeah, I think um, I talked about it. Yes. Can avoiding consanguineous marriage prevent incidents? Um, uh, again, I'm happy to make a brief comment on that one because we did a systematic review looking at consanguinity, and yes, it does increase the risk. Um, we're also very well aware that there's a range of uh, social and cultural aspects to consanguinity, but uh, it is um, a, a scientific fact that uh, gene pools, if they're closely aligned, can result in double recessives coming together. And if that is a component part of craniofacial anomalies, then it increases the risk. Um, I did mention earlier the geographic variation. so. Uh, and said that um, the the uh, reasons for that are largely unknown, but uh, there are regional, geographic, and ethnic differences um, in the prevalence of both cleft palate and cleft lip and palate. Um, okay. Uh, the mention of... Um, Smile Train and its efforts in uh, Nigeria uh, mm -hmm. is mentioned, and indeed, uh, I think we're well aware of the tremendous mm -hmm. uh, support uh, for not only Nigeria but other parts of Sub Saharan Africa now that Smile Train uh, have um, 
been doing a lot of good work also in uh, Ethiopia and Ghana and uh, other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and Kenya. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cleft orthodontic treatment. Um, there is a question about adult orthodontics and yeah. indeed that is another very important aspect of our ongoing attention. Um, very often uh, it's regarded as uh, a childhood problem, but indeed uh, these problems can persist into adulthood and um, our restorative dentists are very well aware of uh, the need for ongoing restorative treatment, maybe even obturators for uh, facilitating uh, uh, speech and eating in adults. So adult um, orthodontic and restorative treatment can still be done at any age, really. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so. Now, does anyone else want to, uh, I think we've come on our chat box to the end yeah. of the questions online. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very happy to continue, obviously, to support uh, all of those who uh, not only were participating in this webinar, but if you do have questions that arise um, after this event, then uh, please make sure that you pass these uh, uh, to us and uh, to our colleagues. Uh, we're very happy to continue to, to support uh, this initiative. And of course, the guidelines, uh, we will be using those to good effect um, for improving cleft care uh, around the world from now on. One other thing that I'll just ask maybe Susanna to comment on, uh, because um, we want to ensure that we are offering and providing support is um, the offer of grants to partners who want to become involved in uh, theft care around the world. Yes. Um... So at the moment, SmileTrain does not offer grants, um, but the goal of the new oral health and comprehensive cleft care guidelines and the upcoming education resources from uh, FDI and SmileTrain with the support from GSK, um, this is to set the foundation for this grant program in the near future. Um, so please stay in touch with SmileTrain to learn when these become available. Thanks uh, for asking. Peter. Yeah, and that means that um, the volunteers can come forward uh, to provide or offer to provide cleft care. Correct. That? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And the best is to to get in touch with uh, Smile Train partners, uh, Smile Train staff. Again, we've we've shared the websites uh, smiletrain.org. Uh, slash oral health care is uh, where you can find the guidelines and and also uh, any opportunities to connect with Smile Train around the world. And I think maybe that's a very good place to uh, to, to to thank everyone uh, for their participation in this. And mm -hmm. on that very positive note, um, we can uh, uh, just recommend everyone to continue to keep. Uh, abreast of all of the de developments that we are uh, suggesting through our guidelines and all of the improvements uh, to ensure that kids are giving the best possible opportunity in life and that a cleft is no barrier to a fruitful and productive uh, uh, life and um, mm -hmm. that's our that's our our major message so to to keep everyone smiling yeah <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, of course, and uh, please allow me to uh, thank, of course, all of those present, Lola, Susana, Peter, uh, of course, our supporter, Smile Friend and GSK, and um, how can I forget all those who have worked in the uh, in the task team? So let me just uh, nominate them, each and every one. This is, of course, you, Peter. This is Professor Mutu Murugan. This is Professor Larsen Usehal. Uh, this is um, Dr. Yan Chi from China, and uh, of course our staff with uh, the executive director and the staff in Geneva. Many, many thanks, and uh, to all the colleagues, please make a large use of the guidelines in order to help most of people around the globe to uh, have a better life. Uh, stay all safe, and thank you once again. Thank you very much, Gerhard. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Gerhard. Bye. Thank you. I just Bye. would like to just add one more thing to invite everyone to celebrate World Smile Day with us. That is upcoming this Friday, October 2nd. Uh, this is a day that Smile Train embraces um, to raise awareness for cleft and um, you know to to highlight our partnerships. Um, so along with JSK, we'll be celebrating. Uh, this Friday, uh, you can visit our website, uh, join us for our live event, which starts at 8 p.m. on Friday, October 2nd, and uh, come, come along and smile with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you.